Mary Kay, good afternoon. Welcome back. Before we start today's topic, I wanted to show you this very neat website out of Johns Hopkins where they track the global cases of the new coronavirus. And it's a very nice site. There are a lot of things you can do here. You can see the total cases, 17,493, total deaths. And then it's broken down into where, so below the cases you see mainland China, most, most of the cases, 17,300 mainland China, and then all the other countries, Japan, Thailand, etc. US has had 11. And this is really minimal compared to what's going on in China. It's amazing that it's been contained so well. We'll see if that continues. Uh, the other thing you can do is you can go down to this bottom graph. You can expand each one of these panels. So this is cumulative cases by day. And the last two days, second and third, you can see on the second, 17,200, 17,000. It only went up 100 cases in the last day. So that's kind of interesting. We'll see if that continues to plateau and maybe go down again. What's missing would be very interesting is the daily case count, although you, you could calculate that from here. On the bottom, of course, is the rest of the world. You can see it's hardly increasing there as well. So this is a great site. I'll put a link probably in CourseWorks so you can check it out. It's uh, very nicely done. Right, today we're going to build some viruses. Before we start talking about the replication cycle, that's going to occupy us for the next dozen lectures or so. We're going to go through every step of the reproduction cycle. But before we do that, I want to talk about how viruses are built, because this really helps you to understand how they're taken apart in the next lecture. Now, first of all, the virus particle, when you look at it, it's made up of proteins, in some cases membranes, as we'll see today. They have very specific functions. Of course, they look beautiful on top of everything, but they also have functions. They have to protect the viral genome, right? That's one of their main functions. Uh, they have to be able to come together and make a stable shell. They have to recognize the viral nucleic acids specifically. Don't want to put cellular nucleic acids in the particle. That would be a waste. And there are very specific mechanisms for that, which we'll talk about later. And then for viruses that have an envelope or a membrane, I use the, the term interchangeably, the proteins have to associate with it. And so here on the top are three examples of virus particles. On the left, influenza virus, which is enveloped. In the middle is an adenovirus, which is made of pure protein and nucleic acid, no envelope around it. And on the right, a bacteriophage, very different configurations. But my goal today is to really simplify all of this for you. So protection of the genome is really important. As virus particles go from host to host, they have to protect it so it's not inactivated. Another function is to deliver the genome once the particle is inside of a cell. And so the viral proteins have to bind cell receptors. They have to uncoat the genome. That's a term I use for releasing the genome from the virus particle. I often call it uncoating. Uh, in many viruses, the ones with membranes, the membranes fuse with the host cell membranes to release the nucleic acid. We're going to talk about all this next time. And then they have to bring the nucleic acid to the right site in the cell. It differs according to the nucleic acid. Sometimes the right site is the cytosol, sometimes it's the nucleus. And the viral proteins have a big role to play in getting the particle to the right place. Here are three more viruses on the left is a rabies or rhabdovirus, an enveloped particle in the middle, a toga virus, also enveloped, and on the right, a pox virus, much bigger. Before we start, let's do some definitions so you understand what I am saying. The first at the top there, subunit. When I say a subunit of a virus particle, I mean a single folded polypeptide chain. And so there in the upper left, are some examples of viral proteins, VPs. These are often the abbreviations for capsid proteins, virus particle proteins. And th those are each an individual polypeptide folded up. That's a subunit. Next, we have a structural unit, which I will often call a protomer or an asymmetric unit. 
This is the basic unit that we use to build up capsids. So here on the right is a capsid. It's a virus particle, and it is made of subunits. You can see the red subunit there, VP3, is part of the capsid right there. But it's also part of a structural unit. Here, it's made up of three of pro these proteins, VP1, 2, and 3, blue, red, and green. Okay, so subunit, structural unit, and then finally capsid is the entire assembly. Capsid is Latin from box, to it's the protein shell that encodes the genome. So this is a word I will use a lot, capsid, and a version of it which I'll tell you about in a moment. Now for some viruses, there's an extra part of them, and that's the envelope or the viral membrane. It's always derived from the host cell because viruses cannot make lipids, so all viral membranes come from the host cell. So here on the left, an example influenza virus, uh, that tan circle around the outer periphery, that's the membrane of that. On the right is a herpes virus, and again, the membrane is the tan layer on the outside. And you can see these membranes are studded with proteins. Those are viral glycoproteins, which we'll talk about today as well. And finally, there's another term which is every year confusing. Every year I try harder. Nucleocapsid or core. The, the, the term can be used interchangeably. It is the nucleic acid protein assembly within the particle. We, we use the word nucleocapsid when it's a discrete substructure. So here in this influenza virus, the RNA plus protein, which are those little pieces inside there, there's RNA plus protein, those are called the nucleocapsids. In this herpes virus on the right, you actually have an, a shell, a capsid. So the capsid above right there, that is in a herpes virus. It's encased in a membrane, and it has the DNA in it. And there, we call it a nucleocapsid, because it's a substructure. It has a membrane around it. Uh, the top right would just be a capsid, not a nucleocapsid. Well, the nucleocapsid contains the genome, and it protects it till it gets, in this case, to the nucleus. It's an extra layer of protection. Now you may say that sounds arbitrary, and much of nomenclature is arbitrary, right? But this stuff is in the literature, so I want to make sure you know it. So that's a capsid, and here it's a nucleocapsid. If this herpes didn't have an envelope or a membrane, if that was herpes virus, it would be a capsid, not a nucleocapsid. Okay, so those are the terms I am going to use. All right, some, some uh, size here to put things in perspective, some of the numbers I'm going to be using. Nanometer, I'll talk about nanometers a lot, 10 to the minus nine meters, which is 10 angstroms or 0.001 microns, right? Those are all the same thing. Uh, we use this to talk about viruses and subviral particles because they're very small. So the alpha helix in a protein, here's an alpha helix on the top right, that's in a protein, that's about a nanometer in diameter. If you think about any typical protein. DNA in, on the middle there, is about two nanometers in diameter, about twice the width of an alpha helix. There's a ribosome, about 20 nanometers in diameter. Poliovirus, 30 nanometers, slightly larger than a ribosome. And one of the bigger viruses, Pandora virus here at the lower right, 1,000 nanometers. So this is huge, and there's some that are slightly bigger. Pithovirus is slightly bigger than that, 1,200 nanometers. One concept that's very important for you to understand is that virus particles are metastable. What that means is sometimes they're stable and sometimes they're not. So we call them metastable. So as I said earlier, capsid proteins, viral structural proteins, have to protect the genome as it travels around from cell to cell, host to host, so they have to be very stable. For example, respiratory virus particles have to be stable in aerosols that we produce when we breathe long enough so that they can reach another host and infect them. But some viruses infect the gastrointestinal tract. They actually pass through the stomach and the small intestine and they remain stable, which is remarkable given all the conditions. They have to remain stable there. But at some point in reproductive cycle, when that virus gets to the right cell, it's got to give up the genome. It has to become unstable. So that's why we call them metastable, because sometimes they're stable and sometimes they're not. So here's an example of a virus uh, that is outside of the cell, extremely stable, but in this case, 
when it binds a cell surface receptor, that's a trigger for it to give up uh, its nucleic acid. And these sorts of activities we'll talk about next time, but the concept of metastability is inherent in the structure of the particle. Somehow the particle has to be built so that it lasts really well in the environment but can come apart when it's on the right cell. Now, metastability is a consequence of the fact that virus particles or virions, so the virion is a name that I use for an infectious virus particle. So when I say virus particle, it may or may not be infectious, but virions means infectious. Virus particles have not attained their minimum free energy conformation. So as a particle exists, it has to surmount an energy barrier to get to that minimum free energy conformation. So here's a illustrative graph where we're looking at free energy on the y-axis and uh, with, with time on the right, if you will. When virus particles are built, energy is built into the particle, into the bonds of the particle. And we call viruses spring-loaded because that energy is then used later to disassemble the particle if the cell provides the right single, signal. If the cell provides a receptor or low pH or protease, number of different conditions. The energy put into the particle during assembly is used to encode it. And so to a disassemble, to get from the stable to the unstable state, viruses have to surmount an energy barrier as shown here. So one is the infectious particle in the environment. To, to uh, give up its genome, which would be state number three, it has to get over a high energy barrier. And that's important because if not for that barrier, viruses would spontaneously be giving up their genomes and that wouldn't be good. And to surmount that barrier, the energy built into the assembly of the capsid has to be liberated. And that trigger for that, as I said, is receptors or low pH or other conditions. So that's metastability. Viruses are metastable. How do you do this? How do you make a particle stable yet unstable? So first of all, stability is made by symmetrical arrangement of identical proteins. You're going to see in a few moments that many virus particles are built by taking one or a few proteins and repeating them multiple times. They have maximal interaction with each other and that gives the particle stability. Well, how can it be unstable at the same time? Well, first of all, these proteins are not covalently joined. In most cases, they are non-covalently joined. And so they can be taken apart or loosened upon infection that provides the right trigger. So in the absence of the trigger, the virus remains stable because of all these interactions of many identical proteins. And under the right condition, the stability is reversed. So that's how metastability uh, is achieved. So uh, viral capsids are metastable because they must protect the genome outside of the cell. They must come apart and release the genome into a cell. They have not obtained a minimum free energy conformation. They are spring-loaded, all of the above. All right, how did we do here? All right, most of you got all of the above, which is correct. Every one of those things explains why viruses are, viral capsids are metastable. They have to protect the genome, they have to come apart, both ends of metastability. They haven't maintained a free, minimum free energy conformation. They have to surmount a barrier to get to it, and we call that spring-loaded. I'm gonna to talk to you now about how viruses are built, and throughout this course, you're gonna see really nice pictures of virus particles. And I just wanna briefly tell you how we get those pictures. And that's the tools of viral structural biology that includes electron microscopy, x-ray crystallography, cryo-electron microscopy, and cryo-electron tomography, and NMR. This is well described in the book in chapter four if, you want to, if you're interested in getting into it in some detail. The technology has improved markedly since the 1930s when the first EM was built. This is a modern day a cryo-electron microscope that I visited at Cornell up in Ithaca. And that's the person who uh, runs it. Look at this thing. It's huge. You have to have very, you have to have liquid nitrogen around to cool things. Lots of wires going any, everywhere. I don't know how people sort this out, but you can use this to uh, solve structures. So 1939, 1940, of course, mentioned this earlier. 
Helmuth, Ruska used an EM to see bacteriophages for the first time. Very important discovery showing that viruses were not liquids, they were particulate. And he published the paper here. It's in German if you want to go look it up. I see bacteriophage in lice. I can, I can get that part. And that was important, but the tech has improved incredibly since these days. This image is taken by negative staining. Biological materials don't have much contrast on their own, so typically we have to stain them. And you know that if you want to look at cells in some way, you stain them with various things. You want to look at tissues, you, you stain them. It's the same with viruses. They don't have contrast. But you can't use the typical stains for viruses. You have to use an electron-dense material. Because remember, electron microscope, you're bombarding the sample with electrons. Electrons much smaller than light particles, and therefore the resolution is greater, but it's typical dyes that you use with light microscopy, you cannot use with electron microscopy. So you use something like uranyl acetate or phosphotungstate. They're, we call this electron dense, they scatter electrons. So you're basically coating the particle with the stain and the electrons are bouncing off of it. So where the virus is, no light is going through. It's a negative stain. The resolution is not great on this, it's about 50 to 75 angstroms, and as I told you earlier, right, the alpha helix is about 10 angstroms or 1.1, 10 angstroms in diameter, one nanometer. So you can't really tell any detailed structural interpretation from negative stained EM, but in the early days, pictures like this were taken and gave us a lot of information. There's an adenovirus where, for the first time, they saw these fibers sticking out of the particle, and it was quite interesting. You can see there's something repeating about the particle structure. Here's a hepatitis B virus, an influenza virus, and a polio virus. So you get some information, but not enough detail to know how they are composed. Yet, just last week, they were taking elect negative stain electron micrographs of the new coronavirus to see what it looked like. Uh, X-ray crystallography now gives you a much, much higher resolution. You can get two to three angstroms resolution, and just maybe 40 years ago, this became possible with viruses. Initially, it was done with proteins. Remember, myoglobin was one of the first proteins to be crystallized. But then it was possible with viruses only because computers were developed to, to take care of the massive data sets that were generated. You couldn't deal with the data sets of a virus structure before computers. The way it works is, in the old days anyway, you had to get your virus to form a crystal. So you would purify tons and tons of virus and figure out conditions for it to crystallize. And that often took a long time and never, sometimes it didn't work. Nowadays you can buy crystallization kits, which are trays with different chemicals in each one, and you put your virus and see what conditions give you a crystal. Once you get crystals, you bombard them with x-rays and you hope that the crystal diffracts the x-rays. Sometimes they don't, sometimes they fall apart, but in some cases they will diffract the x-rays and in the old days, you used a piece of film to capture the diffraction pattern. If you remember the famous x-ray film that Rosalind Franklin took in the, and Watson and Crick stole from her desk, uh, they, they held it up. And that was a diffraction pattern like this. Nowadays, we can use detectors where the, you don't need film anymore. They're, they're uh, image detectors directly. But what, what, this fraction, what this pattern means is where all the atoms are located there. The x-rays are bouncing off. Uh, the atoms in the crystal, and you can tell where each atom is based on their location there. A cryo-electron microscopy came, came around uh, years later, and only, um, what was it, 2017, the Nobel Prize in Chemistry was awarded to three individuals for their work in developing the technology to do cryo-EM. Uh, Jacques Duboucher, uh, Joaquin Frank, who's up at the Medical School of Columbia, and Richard Henderson. And the way this works is you don't have to make a crystal. You take your preparation of virus particle and you freeze it very quickly in water, and that's enough to give it contrast. And that top is an electron micrograph of the frozen virus particles. Uh, and then you take images of many, many particles, hundreds of particles. And the idea is that each particle is oriented in a slightly different pr position in three dimensions. You take all of your pictures and you process them to make a three-dimensional image. You do uh, Fourier transforms, and you, you orient all these 
phases, and then you do a reverse transform, and eventually you can get your 3D reconstruction. And this now has gotten to very high resolution. Uh, it, it's approaching X-ray crystallography in terms of resolution because not only is the tech being improved, but the computational approaches are really improving as well. Now, the, the cryo-electron tomography is a variant of this where you don't have to photograph so many particles, but you take a particle and you tilt the stage, so you make your own three-dimensional image of it. And a lot of the images that I will show you today were made by cryo uh, EM. So here's an example of the two technologies. This is poliovirus, whose structure was solved by X-ray crystallography in 1985. That was the first animal virus to have its structure solved. Uh, 2.9 angstroms, and you can see where every atom is in the three-dimensional structure. You know, thousands and thousands of atoms in that particle, and you can get a, a, a coordinate list, XYZ coordinate list for those atoms, and draw pictures like this one, and you can color them as you will. This one is depth cued, which means the atoms that are farthest away from the center are light, and the ones closer are dark. So you can get an, an, exam, uh, an impression of the surface of the particle. On the right is the same virus solved by cryo-EM, 20 angstroms. You can see you don't see any detail. But now, of course, you can do it at 2.9 angstroms, most likely. This is just to show you that at one time, uh, it wasn't as comparable to uh, X-ray crystallography, but cryo-EM you can do in a few weeks. And when new viruses are isolated, they can be done rapidly because you don't need to make crystals. So when Zika virus emerged in 2015, within six months, the structure was solved by cryo-EM. These are some images I made on our computer. You can download the coordinates in their programs, free programs out there that you can use to manipulate them. On the upper left is a space filling view. I've colored the proteins differently so you can see their arrangement. And here on the right is a ribbon diagram where I've zoomed in so you can see how the proteins interact with each other. So lots of very, very useful information you can get from this. This is one of the biggest viruses, Cafeteria Rowenbergensis virus. Uh, this was done by Xuan Zhao at the University of Texas, El Paso. This was only just published. It took him years and years to solve this. But he told me just to do like one turn of this virus requires 3 million CPU hours. There's so many atoms in this particle. It's over 30, 300 nanometers, 15,000 capsid proteins. And he made this movie of it rotating on the ocean because that's where its host lives in the ocean. And this virus infects the host in the ocean. It's huge. He said it would crash his computer continuously while doing this, but they are able to solve the structure. So you can do a lot with the technology. Now, the other day I told you about the Baltimore scheme, seven different genome types, right? Well, I can use the subway again to illustrate the different types of virus particles. There are only three can put everything in this course in terms of two subway lines here in New York City. The number seven genomes, the number three virus particles. There are three kinds of virus particles. There are particles with helical symmetry. And that's tobacco mosaic virus on the upper right, the first virus discovered. We'll talk about how that's built. There are viruses with icosahedral symmetry. Second down there, like poliovirus. And then the rest that don't fit into these two categories, we call complex because we don't really understand how they are built. They don't fit into any one of these two character categories. They include pox viruses and pithoviruses and Pando Pandora viruses. They're very, very big viruses with really no symmetry to them. And I'm going to tell you today mainly about how to build helical and icosahedral viruses. And this actually starts, this story starts with Watson and Crick, who all of you know solved the structure of DNA in 1953, which happens to be the year I was born. And I always say that's one of the reasons I became a scientist, because somehow I felt that. But after they finished with DNA structure, they turned to virus particles. And they noticed that when you look at all the EMs of virus particles that were published at that point in the 50s, most of them were either spherical or rod-shaped. So here we have rod-shaped tobacco mosaic virus, and then there are other viruses that were subsequently discovered that were rod-shaped. And here, poliovirus is spherical. 
And so they thought, okay, viral genomes are small. Of course, that's what we knew back then. We know now they're big, but the principle is still similar. Viral genomes are small, so you can't have a lot of proteins dedicated to building a particle. You don't have enough genetic space. This is, called, this is the theory of genetic economy. So they thought there must be a few proteins repeated over and over and over again to build either a round or a uh, rod-like virus particle. So that was their contribution. And they, they developed that into a theory where they said, OK, for these rod-like viruses, they, the proteins are a few proteins repeated over and over again. They are distributed with helical symmetry. And for the round viruses, they are distributed with icosahedral symmetry. So I'm going to go through both of those with you and explain what they mean. But Watson and Crick made a big contribution to our understanding of structure, which of course was subsequently refined by uh, other individuals as well. So there are rules of symmetry that we can use to understand these virus particles. And they're very simple. First of all, uh, rule one, every subunit has identical bonding contacts with its neighbors. So basically, you have the same protein, or just a few repeated over and over again, and they interact in similar ways as a consequence because they're the same protein. And that gives you a symmetric arrangement, and it gives you a lot of stability, as we said before. And the second rule is these interactions are usually non-covalent, as I said earlier, to keep metastable particles metastable, you have to make the bonds non-covalent. And this non-covalent assembly not only gives you reversibility in, in the virus coming in, but it's also uh, it gives you error-free assembly. So as we'll see later when we talk about assembly, if, uh, if there's a mistake made in the cell during assembly of a particle, it can be reversed and corrected. And you couldn't do that, of course, if you had a covalent bond. Symmetry and self-assembly are beautiful things. Many capsids will self-assemble. And in fact, you can make the proteins in a cell, and they will self-assemble into what we call virus-like particles. They are empty capsids. And we have a couple of vaccines that work that way. There's no virus genome present. There's just the gene encoding the capsid protein, which is just a part of the genome. And you can put that in a cell and have the proteins produced. The hepatitis B virus vaccines, the human papillomavirus vaccines, HPV, are virus-like particles made in yeast. So we take advantage of this symmetry and self-assembly properties of viral proteins to make vaccines. Here's how it works. You take, you first you have to know what viral protein is in the capsid, but you then can take it and you synthesize it in cell culture. And in the case of the papillomavirus, which is shown here, one subunit, the single folded peptide chain, five of those assemble into the structural unit, which is a pentamer. We call it that because there are five subunits making it up, one, two, three, four, five. And then those pentamers assemble to form the virus particle. And there you see it on the right. And these are colored. You don't see it very well on the screen here, but on your PDF, you could probably find the red subunit here in this one pentamer. So again, this is an empty particle. It is non-infectious. It is completely without danger. And it's really important. It prevents cancer, as we will see. So let's dissect helical symmetry. Here's an example of a virus built with helical symmetry, tobacco mosaic virus. The coat protein molecules, so the coat, this capsid is made up of individual coat proteins. They're shown at the lower left here in yellow. And they each join with each other to form this helix. And that is what makes the particle. Each of these little nubby things is a single coat protein joined with each other, and they wrap around to form a helix. And they're also binding to the RNA, which is inside of it. That's shown in the right-hand diagram there. So the coat proteins bind not only to each other, but to the RNA, and that forms the virus particle. That is helical symmetry. They're making a nice helix. And there's the electron micrograph of tobacco mosaic virus. That's it. It's a naked helical particle. There's no membrane. It's just that. And it's made of one protein repeated many times uh, wrapped around the RNA. So as you can imagine, the protein is protecting the RNA. And there are protein-protein contacts that are symmetrical and lead to the formation of this helix. So you can see the sizes here. 
about 18 nanometers in diameter, and that, that bar is 10 nanometers in length. Animal viruses you, are also built with helical symmetry, but they're always enveloped. Only the plant viruses have naked helices as the virus particle. So here's an example of a, 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 vir a paramyxovirus, Sendai virus. It's a family of viruses, including measles virus. These are made with helical nucleocapsids. There it is right there with the RNA inside and the single protein here, it's called NP, nucleoprotein. And that protein is repeated many times to form a helix, thousand nanometers long, and it's protecting the viral RNA. But in, in this case, the, the virus particle is then enveloped. This nucleocapsid is not naked as it is for TMV. Uh, so you can see here an electron micrograph of a measles virus particle with the uh, nucleocapsid inside of it. It's this one's actually broken and the nucleocapsid is spilling out. So that's why we call it a nucleocapsid because it's inside a membrane. In tobacco mosaic virus, it would just be a capsid because it's not a substructure. All right, so animal viruses with this kind of symmetry are always enveloped. A couple more examples of helical symmetry. Uh, vesicular stomatitis virus is a rabies-like virus, bullet-shaped, very characteristic morphology, very popular as a vector. They use it now to make vaccines for other viruses. We'll talk about that at the end of the course. But it's got an envelope and it has a helical nucleocapsid within it. It's RNA plus a protein called the nucleocapsid protein, or N protein, sorry, in this case. And on the right is the structure, the X-ray structure of the N protein. And you can see it binding RNA. There are nine nucleotides of RNA there. So it's kind of a two-lobed protein with a RNA binding cleft. Here the protein uh, is shown multiple subunit, multiple copies of the protein binding a circular RNA. And in the file of virus particle, you make a very, very big helix. That's shown on the right here. The structure was solved by cryo-EM. And here is the RNA protein complex curling around and around and around. And it has a, a cap at one end. It's unusual. The other, the other helical structures I've shown you, they're open at both ends. For some reason, this has a cap where it all comes to a point. And this whole thing is wrapped in an envelope, which are these two outer colors, blue and, and purple, there. So another example of helical symmetry. And there are whole lots of viruses with helical symmetry. They're shown here. We'll, we'll revisit lots of those. But just so that you know, uh, we've talked about measles, mumps, other paramyxoviruses like Sendai. They are enveloped. They have a nucleocapsid, which is helical, as you can see in the picture. Rabies virus we just talked about a helical nucleocapsid with an envelope. Influenza virus is a virus with a helical nucleocapsid. It, it has it in eight pieces in this case. Each RNA shown on the right here is wrapped in proteins, uh, nucleoproteins NP, and then there are eight of those. So that's the nucleoprotein. Uh, filoviruses like Ebola viruses all the way here have helical nucleocapsids that are enveloped. You can see the curly helix there. So I think just by looking at these pictures, you can see the nucleocapsid is that nucleic acid protein assembly that is within the particle. It's the substructure. In these cases, it has an envelope around it. These, of course, are all uh, RNA viruses. So here is the coronavirus. It happens to have a helical nucleocapsid. And there's the structure of it on the left. It has an envelope which contains gly uh, glycoproteins. And inside is this uh, long green RNA, the nucleoprotein plus RNA. That's the nucleocapsid. And in this case, it's 29,000 bases long. It's quite long. Now, when this first, the first patients uh, had this virus infection, and the virus was isolated from them, last time, a few times ago, I told you about cell culture experiments to identify this virus. At the same time, they took electron micrographs of it and here's one that was published in the New England Journal. It's not very good, unfortunately. This one on the right is a better photograph, but it's not of the new coronavirus. But I want to show it to you because it shows you how this, name, this virus got the name coronavirus. When they first saw these particles in the electron microscope, they said, oh, it looks like there's a corona around each one. You see those little spikes? Those are the spike glycoproteins, which correspond to uh, these molecules spike here. Those are those 
by negative staining. They say, oh, it looks like the corona of the sun, right? You look at the sun pictures, you see these things. So they called them coronaviruses. So on the left is from a patient in Wuhan. You can't see the spikes very well, but they're there. And that's why they call it coronaviruses. So these are, again, envelope viruses with helical nucleocapsids. Both DNA and RNA viruses have helical symmetry. And here's a selection of viruses on the top left. There are viruses of archaea, double-stranded DNA viruses. Archaea is the third domain of life, right? Bacteria, archaea, eukaryotes. Uh, and these have their own viruses, not as well studied as everyone else, but they're there and they're quite remarkable. So this has a helical nucleocapsid and it's enveloped as well. Another double-stranded uh, DNA virus of archaea, uh, which looks different, it has, it's naked, and uh, it has tail fibers to attach to the archaeal host. There are viruses of bacteria that have helical symmetry with single-stranded DNA. And then for RNA viruses, there are the rod-like uh, viruses. The tobacco mosaic virus would be a rod-like virus. These are negative strand viruses. And then there are what we call flexuous plus strand RNA viruses of plants, also with hel helical symmetry, but they're not rigid like TMV. They are flexuous, as the name implies. So quite a variety of helical symmetries. If you want to build your own helical virus, you get these buckyballs, these little magnets. And um, there's one. If you come to office hours, my desk is full of these. And over the years, students have given me many different colors. So that's why we can make really long ones with different colors. And that's just exactly the way a helix is made, by putting subunits and wrapping them around. They're fun. They're really good. And you can still order these. Buckyball viruses. Uh, next question is, uh, which of the following describes virus symmetry and self-assembly? A, the bonding contacts are usually covalent. B, the bonding contacts of subunits are usually non-covalent. C, each subunit has different bonding contacts with its neighbors. D, self-assembly does not occur. E, none of the above. So let's see how we did. Uh, the answer is the bonding contacts are usually non-covalent, which most of you got. They're not usually covalent. A, that's wrong. And nobody got C or D. Good. So they are non-covalent, usually non-covalent. That gives them metastability and reversibility. All right, let's move on to round viruses, spherical viruses. The question here, how do you make a round virus from proteins that are irregularly shaped. So there's an electron micrograph of poliovirus. Looks roughly roundish, right? And on the right is one of the poliovirus proteins, VP1, which does not look round at all. So how do you get from what's on the right here to the left? And here are some clues that drove uh, the solution of this problem. Number one, all of the round capsids have multiple numbers of pro precise multiples in terms of numbers of proteins. And multiples of 60 are very common, like 60, 180, 240, 960, the number of proteins that make up the virus particle. Second clue is that these spherical viruses come in many sizes, from small ones like polio to Mimi viruses and cafeteria Rowan Bergensis virus. But capsid proteins are usually between 20 and 60 kilodaltons in size. So in other words, as the virus particles get bigger, the capsid proteins don't get bigger, but simply the number of proteins that make up the capsid increases in number. So Rotson and Crick looked at all of this, and they concluded that these particles must be built with icosahedral symmetry. So what is icosahedral symmetry? So here on the right is an icosahedron. It is one of the platonic solids, it has 20 faces. Each face is an equilateral triangle. And that arrangement of equilateral triangles gives you what we call axes of symmetry. There are five, three, and two-fold axes of symmetry. There are 12 each. So here on this particle, the green is the five-fold axis. And it's called that simply because there are five subunits around it. There are five triangles around it. The threefold axis 
in red has three triangles around it, the twofold has two. Very straightforward. On the bottom, the individual axes are shown in a different view. So this arrangement allows the formation of a closed shell, a very stable closed shell with the smallest number of protein subunits, 60. You can make a very small virus particle with just 60 copies of one protein. So Watson and Crick came to this because the fact that you make round particles with irregular proteins uh, and as the particles get bigger, the protein sizes stay the same. And they, they decided this was the way it was done. And this has pretty much stood up since then. There are some exceptions, but most of these symmetrical particles, if they're not rod-like, they look, they're built with icosahedral symmetry. So let's start with the simplest one. It's diagrammed on the left there. It's made of 60 identical protein subunits. So here the protein, the polypeptide is the same as the structural unit. So sometimes it's, there is one protein that e equals the structural unit, uh, or sometimes there are multiple ones, as you'll see in a moment. But here the protein subunit is the structural unit. And on the left is an example of such a particle. Uh, we call this a T equals one particle. I'm going to explain T numbers in a moment. And each of these commas is a single protein. And there's 60 commas on this particle. And you can see that there are five-fold and two-fold and three-fold axes of symmetry made by the arrangement of these proteins. These proteins all interact in an identical fashion, either head-to-head -head or tail-to-tail. -tail. So if you look at this, the heads of the commas have the round part. You can see head-to-head -head interactions or tail-to-tail -tail interactions. So here's a great example of identical protein-protein interactions in a particle, fulfilling the original idea of the rules of symmetry that we stated earlier. Now, it's important to remember that although the proteins are, are arranged with icosahedral symmetry, it doesn't actually look like an icosahedron. An icosahedron is this geometric particle, but virus particles don't look like that. They actually look spherical if you look at them in the electron micrographs, and that's because the proteins are arranged with the symmetry of an icosahedron, but they are not flat and triangular. Okay, it's very important to remember. So that's your simplest icosahedral capsid. Uh, there are plenty of examples of viruses that are built this way. One of them is a parvovirus. Remember the virus that can infect you or your cat or your dog. It causes fifth disease in humans, can kill your pets. That's a, a, a parvovirus. And this is a small capsid, 25 nanometers in diameter, just slightly smaller than poliovirus, made up of 60 copies of a single capsid protein. And it contains a single-stranded DNA genome. So here on the bottom left is the structure of the single capsid protein. And parts of it are colored red and blue, yellow, and green, because now when we assemble them into the virus particle on the right, you can see the contribution of different parts of that protein. So there are 60 of these single proteins comprising this capsid on the right. The triangle is the subunit and the structural unit, which is one protein. Remember, these, these kinds of viruses, it's the same thing. And you get five-fold axes of symmetry. Like here, you can see one, two, three, four, five of the blue parts, which are down here in the protein, around the five-fold axis. There are also three-fold and two-fold axes of symmetry. So again, this is a T equals one particle. And you have one protein, which is the subunit and the structural unit. That's the red area there. And then the structural unit, uh, 12 of those go up, go in to make the virus particle. So these are the smallest particles that we know of. One protein repeated 60 times. Now, how do you make bigger particles? You add more subunits. You don't use bigger proteins. You add more subunits. And by doing so, now you get slightly different interactions among the proteins. And so here is a virus particle made up of 180 identical subunits. Remember, the first one was 60. Now we have 180. It's the same protein. 
And when you do this now, when you add more subunits, the particle gets bigger. And as a consequence, you have two different kinds of interactions among subunits. You have pentamers and hexamers. And that's very simple. Pentamers are units of five, hexamers units of six. And we can find them uh, very easily here on this particle. Here's a pentamer shown by the green pentagon. And there are one, two, three, four, five orange subunits around it. And then the red triangle is a hexamer with six of the purple subunits around it. They're all the same protein. They're arranged differently in pentamers and hexamers. It's a way you have to do it in order to make a bigger particle. So because of this, the original rules of symmetry had to be modified when people learned there were bigger viruses made this way. The original rule said all the interactions among the protein subunits are identical. But now they can't be anymore because you have hexamers and pentamers. And so they look similar, but they're not identical. And that's called quasi-equivalent. They all engage in head-to-head, tail-to-tail, but there are differences so that you now have pentamers and hexamers. And you need that to make, <clears throat> make a bigger particle. Quasi-equivalence is just a bending of the original rule saying the proteins interact similarly, but not identically. That's how you get a bigger particle. So quasi-equivalence, again, when a capsid has more than 60 subunits, anything greater than 60, each protein has a quasi-equivalent position. The properties in different environments are similar but not identical. And you can remember that most easily by remembering that there are pentamers and hexamers uh, in these particles. Now let's get back to the T number, which I mentioned a couple of times. The T number can be described mathematically, but I prefer it to describe it to you structurally. T stands for triangulation number. It is the number of facets in each of the faces of this particle. So let's go through some of these and explain it that way. Here we have on the top virus particles with T equals one triangulation numbers. The structural unit is, the subunit is the same as the structural unit, the protein this polypeptide is the same as the structural unit. And that's a T equals one, because you see this polypeptide forms one of these uh, triangles, and that's the definition of a T equals one. You can actually calculate the total number of subunits in a virus particle by multiplying the T number by 60. A T equals three particle. Now this, the subunit, the polypeptide, there are three of those making up the structural unit, one, two, three. And you can see that outlined in red there. So three compared to one, the triangulation number is three. Very simple. And the total number of subunits are one eight. And you can keep going up. You can do T equals four, where there are four proteins in the structural unit. Here there are 12 proteins. So T simply describes the number of proteins in this structural unit. And you can get quite large. And so here I use buckyballs to illustrate this is perfect for this. I went to visit a chemist at Indiana State a couple of years ago. He had, this all, had these all over his office. And I didn't know you could make icosahedral capsids from buckyballs. So I learned from him. So there is a T equals one. 60 magnets, all the same. Uh, the subunit, only pentamers. No hexamers in a T equals one. And you can see them colored all the pentamers, 12 times 5, 60 subunits. That's how it's built. On the right is a T equals 3, 180 subunits of the same magnet, but they're here in pentamers in red and hexamers in blue. So pentamer, hexamer. And again, when you put more in, that's what you get. You automatically get hexamers and pentamers. So buckyballs are great, and there's a video, if you want to look at that, of me building these things. All right, so here are some viruses built with this kind of symmetry, poliovirus is a 30 nanometer particle made up of 180 subunits. Now, there's th actually three different proteins making up this, not one protein. So you can, it can work either way. This is actually called pseudo T equals three because it's not a real T equals three. A real T equals three would be the same protein 180 times. And there are viruses like that, but I'm showing you poliovirus. The subunits are VP1, 2, and 3, which are shown on this icosahedral diagram in blue, yellow, and red. They, the polypeptides, BP1, 2, and 3, make up this structural unit. 
And they're all, they're all wedge-shaped, by the way, these individual polypeptides. They pack together to form these structural units. Uh, so you make five, five of those make a pentamer, and then uh, 12 structural units make up the whole virus particle. So here's a virus particle at the lower left with the individual protein polypeptides colored. And on this particle, as you would predict, you have five-fold axes of symmetry, you have pentamers, and you have hexamers as a consequence of being more than T, at more than 60 subunits. Anything greater than T equals one, anything with more than 60 subunits, you automatically have hexamers in addition to pentamers. So this is T equals three. Remember the structural unit has three polypeptides. In this case, they're different. That's why it's pseudo T equals three, but that doesn't really matter. The point is that T equals three, 180 uh, subunits. Polyomaviruses are also nice examples of this where I can illustrate assembly a little bit. These are 15 nanometer particles, slightly bigger and they are composed of 72 pentamers of, of VP1, 360 subunits. So this is very much like the papillomavirus structure I showed you earlier. There's a polypeptide VP1, which is the basic protein, and here there are five VP1 molecules that make up a pentamer, and the virus particle is made up of 72 pentamers. And this middle image, most of them are gray, but the ones uh, in the middle are colored. This purple one is a pentamer with five neighbors, and this is a pentamer with six neighbors. And so it's a little confusing because the subunit is a pentamer, but it's arranged in pentameric and hexameric arrays on the surface of the particle. What's cool about this is that, see these extensions of the polypeptide sticking out from each subunit? Those actually engage a VP1 from the neighboring pentamer to help lock them together. It's not covalent, it's non-covalent interactions, but it helps give this particle stability because now as we get bigger and bigger, we have to do other things to keep the particle stable. Just the interactions between proteins is not enough. You have to have uh, things like this arm. And you can't see it here, but I'm going to show it to you in the next slide. Before I leave this, though, here on the upper right is a schematic of this particle. Inside of it is double-stranded DNA, and this is one of the few viruses where that DNA is wrapped around histones. As you can see here, it's what I call a chromatinized, or it forms mini chromosomes. All right, let's take a closer look at this. So here's the same virus. I made this on my computer, and it is the individual pentameric arrays of VP1. Here in the middle is a colored one, five copies of VP1. All the other ones are the same color. But I wanted to show you how the extensions, the N-terminal extensions of VP1 wrap around to the neighboring pentamers. Here in yellow, you see this one is wrapped around the blue protein, which is the neighboring pentamer. And this, these are forming non-covalent interactions, and that gives it stability. So as, you, as I said, as you get bigger and bigger, you do things like this. You have more extensive interactions between neighboring subunits. And as you'll see in a moment, you actually have other proteins in the particle that help keep the main structural units together. Uh, which of the following are characteristics of icosahedral symmetry in viral capsids? Produces a solid with 20 faces, each an equilateral triangle, allows formation of a closed gel with 60 identical subunits, five, three, and two-fold axes. T number describes number of facets per icosahedral face, or all of the above. Uh, most of you got all of the above, which is correct. All these things are correct. Solid with 20 faces, equilateral triangles, closed shell, 60 subunits. That's the smallest, of course. You could build bigger. Five, three, two-fold axes, and the T number, number of facets per icosahedral face. All of that is correct. So let's just talk a little bit about making bigger viruses and what other things happen when you make a bigger and a bigger particle. Here are adenoviruses, 150 nanometers now. So the last virus we looked at was 50, getting quite bigger. This is a T equals 25, 25 subunits per face of the icosahedron. These, here's an electron micrograph in the middle. You can see the icosahedral symmetry. But then there are these fibers sticking out at each of the 12 five-fold axes. There is a fiber sticking out. And this illustrates having a basic protein that makes up the shell and then other proteins with specialized roles. So let's first consider the capsid. It's shown at the bottom here in an illustration in the middle. That is made up of a proton called, protein called hexon. It's a trimer of individual polypeptides, blue, green, and red. 
So the trimer is the structural unit, which is then made repeated many times to uh, make up the capsid. And each of these little structures is a hexon trimer. And if you look at this, you will find pentamers and hexamers, as you would predict. In other words, five subunits, five trimers of hexons, and six uh, trimers of hexons around them. At each five-fold axis, there is what is called a fiber attached. And the fiber structure is shown on the right here. It composes a penton base, which interacts at the five-fold axis uh, with the hexon. And then a shaft, which is a extended fibrous trimer, three copies of the same polypeptide. You can see them green, blue, and red. And at the top, a, a little knobby area. And that is stuck in at each of the five-fold axes. And this is where the virus attaches to the cell receptor. We'll see next time the receptor interaction occurs at the tip of the knob. So that's a protein with a specialized function, in addition to the hexon, which makes up the capsid. But even beyond that, if you look at the diagram in the upper right, there are lots of other proteins up here with different numbers. Some of them are binding the DNA genome in the particle. And then some of them are interlaced among the hexons. You can see these brown proteins. The hexons are in light tan. And then there are, here, protein 9 is stuck in among, in between the hexon. In fact, cat, protein 9 we consider to be cement to help keep the hexons together. It's so big that you need something else in there. And this little protein helps the hexons to stick together. So that's what I mean when I say there are additional proteins with other specialized functions. And some of these proteins are also involved in uncoding, as we'll see next time. Real viruses are interesting because these are icosahedral non-envelope viruses with two icosahedral shells, one on the inside and one on the outside. And so the, there's a diagram on, on the left of the particle, double-stranded RNA in the interior. And we have an outer capsid in purple and an inner capsid in tan. And on the right are the two icosahedral shells whose structures were solved separately. And the one on the left is the outer shell. It's made up of trimers of VP7 with a T equals 13 triangulation. And the one on the inside, the inner layer, is made up of monomers of VP3 with a T equals 2. So totally different triangulation numbers on these two icosahedral capsids. Now you may ask, why are there two? Well, next time we will see when we uncoat this virus, you'll see that the outer shell is protecting the virus as it goes through the environment, and that's taken off when the particle gets inside the cell to release the genome from the inner shell. Bacteriophages are another uh, illustration of this kind of structure. It's a combination of helical and icosahedral symmetry. This is a typical, what we call tailed bacteriophage with the uh, icosahedral head. It's a helical tail and then tail fibers attached to it. There's a base plate here at the bottom. So it's put together of different components. The head is made with icosahedral symmetry. The tail is helical symmetry, similar to what we've talked about, although the DNA is in the head of this particle. And then the base plate is even different. And here are the different components. The head is shown in panel B, uh, and the uh, part of the tail and the base plate here. The tail is attached at one of the 12 vertices of the capsid. Some of these are contractile. They will attach to the bacterial host via the base plate, and then the tail will contract and help inject the DNA into cells. In others, the DNA is packaged at high pressure in these capsids to help get it out. Now, this base plate, one of its functions is to poke a hole in the membrane of the bacterium. And people have solved the structures of these base plates, and they're really remarkable. Here is a bacteriophage on the upper left, and it's contracting its tail, and the, the spike at the base of the base plate has extended. And that will punch a hole in the membrane, and then the DNA will come out through the hole. And here on the bottom are some cryo-EM structures. On the left is an underview. You can see the spike in red down there. And then the um, higher resolution structure in panel C. You can see it's a trimer of three identical proteins, green, blue, and red. And it, what kills me is it looks like a spike, right? The way these proteins fold. I mean, we used to draw these phages with spikes because we figured 
yeah, it must be poking a hole. It's got to look like a spike. We anthropomorphize everything, but it really does look like a spike. It's tapered. And these three proteins on the right, here's the, um, the, the trace so you can see the kind of proteins there are. A lot of uh, beta strands here to strengthen this spike. And it gets narrower and narrower as it goes to the bottom. They get, the strands get shorter and shorter. And then at the bottom, it's all loops. And they're held together by three uh, amino acids that interact with this iron. This little sphere is a, is a molecule of iron, which is in each spike. And it coordinates all three of the monomers to keep them together. And so this functions to poke a hole in the, in the membrane. I think this is great. Uh, another virus that has a specialized function, herpes viruses, these have an envelope, a nucleocapsid inside. Inside of that is the DNA. And the structure of the nucleocapsid is shown in the upper right. This has been solved by cryo-EM, and this is kind of a tracing of it. And it's very complicated. You can see there are lots of different accessory proteins. There are pentamers and hexamers here. Uh, but what I want to point out to you, and of course it's all surrounded by an envelope, is that at one of the five-fold axes of symmetry, it's different from the rest of the particle in that there is a portal. This purple guy here is one portal, and this is an electron micrograph where they have put antibodies to the portal protein. This portal protein only occurs at this portal, and you can see the black dots staining the uh, portal protein. So at one five-fold axis of symmetry, there's a portal, and this is where the DNA goes in when these capsids are built, and that's where it comes out when they uncoat into cells. And then we're going to talk about that next time. It's quite interesting. So another example of a specialized structure as we get into uh, larger and larger viruses. So someone years ago gave me a herpes keychain, which illustrates this really well. So here on the left, the thing is closed, and there are glycoproteins on the outside. You can open it, and you can see the capsid inside the icosahedral capsid, and there's one portal. They actually knew to put a portal on it, one portal at the five-fold axis where the DNA goes in and out, and you can actually open the capsid and see the DNA inside there. Really realistic. Now, many viruses have an envelope, as I've mentioned before. A few facts about this envelope, it is always derived from the host cell because viruses can't make uh, lipids and it's acquired by budding of the nucleocapsid through some cell membrane. It can be many different membranes, but it's always the same membrane for virus. It can be nucleus ER Golgi plasma membrane, but it's always virus specific. And the nucleocapsids inside can have helical or icosahedral symmetry. So here's a quick overview of budding. The viral components are assembling at the plasma membrane here and the particle comes out. This is what I mean by budding. We'll explore this in some detail later. But what is inside can have helical or icosahedral symmetry. And so when you have an envelope, you need to have viral proteins in it. Otherwise, the virus will be able to attach to cells. We call these integral membrane glycoproteins. They typically have what we call an ectodomain and a transmembrane part and a part that's in the interior of the virus particle. The ectodomain is the part that attaches to receptors. Antibodies are directed against it when you are infected and you make antibodies against viruses that can block infection. They're made against the external part of this protein. And they often oligomerize and, and form what we call spikes because they look like spikes in the electron micrograph. Here's an influenza virus on the lower left. And you can see a spiky structure around the periphery. This is made up of individual uh, viral glycoproteins as shown in the middle diagram there. So every virus with an envelope has some kind of viral glycoprotein uh, in that envelope. And these glycoproteins can be perpendicular to the membrane, like for influenza virus, as shown on the left. Sometimes they're flat on the membrane surface. Flaviviruses like Zika, Dengue, West Nile, etc. Their glycoproteins lie flat on the membrane of the virus, and uh, they will have the same functions. They function in cell attachment and uh, uncoating of the genome. And there's an additional feature of these I want to point out to you. Viruses like influenza virus and many others they have what we call an unstructured envelope. The glycoproteins are inserted with no apparent symmetry, but the flaviviruses and others have a structured envelope. 
these glycoproteins on the surface are actually arranged with icosahedral order. As you can see, there's a five and a two and a three-fold axis. And that is because the proteins have the ability to interact with one another in that kind of symmetry. So here are some more examples of viruses with envelopes with a helical or an icosahedral nuclear capsid. We've seen lots of viruses with helical nuclear capsids in envelopes like influenza virus, Ebola virus, uh, and then some have icosahedral capsids inside of the envelope. Herpes viruses uh, on the top right. Toga viruses like rubella virus. And I show you the toga virus because here's an example where the glycoproteins also assume icosahedral symmetry because the underlying capsid is icosahedral. The flaviviruses, the capsid is not icosahedral. The glycoproteins on their own can assume icosahedral order. These are the complex viruses that are built of many, many different proteins with no symmetry, some parts resembling cells, pox viruses, Pandora, pithoviruses. These have membranes, they have DNA genomes, they have specialized structures. Uh, the, pitho, the Pandora has a pore at one end, which is probably where the DNA comes out. The uh, pithovirus also has a structure. Guess what the French called this? A cork, <laughs> right? It would figure. They call this a cork, and they say it comes out in the DNA because they drink a lot of wine. You know, they're thinking about they're thinking about corks. And there it is. The pith, that's an EM of the pithovirus cork. I don't think it looks like a cork, but maybe I need to drink more wine, right? <laughs> All right. Finally, last thing I want to tell you, besides the capsid, the nucleic acid, the glycoproteins, there are other things in virus particles that we consider structural components. And we're going to touch on a lot of these through this course. Many viruses have enzymes of all sorts that are listed here, including uh, in, in retrovirus particles, which are shown here, the reverse transcriptase and the integrase, proteases, and many others. Some viruses have other proteins that are needed to turn on transcription when the DNA gets into the host cell. And some viruses have histones, lipids, and many other components. And some We'll, we'll touch on some of these as we go through uh, individual steps and see what these do. I don't want you to think that a virus is just protein and lipid and glycoproteins. There are other things in it as well. So next time we will start going through the replication cycle, step at a time. We're going to start by seeing how viruses attach to cells and uncoat their genome.